Okay, so we're going to go over the second uh, loss, uh, which is the softmax classifier, which is basically like logistic regression, but multinomial because we have multiple classes or multiple um, output classes, right? So we have cat, car, frog again. Okay, so uh, the problem that we had that we observed earlier was that, you know, we're getting out these scores which are fine, they're numeric values, and we're saying higher is better for determining a class, but we don't have any intuition for what the scores actually mean, right? Because we can say we have an a, a unbounded loss and we can have a unbounded scores. So what we want to do is change that, uh, take the scores and give them a semantic interpretation. And the way we do this is uh, by pushing them uh, through um, a function that's going to uh, constrain it to the bound of zero and one. Okay, so that's gonna give us probabilities, right? And uh, because of the computational effects of, of um, multiplying probabilities together, uh, you know, so you multiply many probabilities together, you get underflow for computers, we would rather sum up many small numbers. And so what we will do is we'll in fact take the log of the probabilities Right? And because the log is a monotonic function, it doesn't change the rank of the values, but allows you to substitute products of small numbers to sums of small numbers. And that's very good because basically when you add things, you don't incur underflow or overflow much less often than the case of underflow and overflow for multiplication. Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to do. Any questions about that so far? So hopefully those statements make sense. So there were two things that I said there, right? So one, I said we're going to take probabilities. So we're going to take these scores and pass them through some functions to get us scores between 1 and negative 1, okay, or 1 and 0 equivalently, okay? So that's going to give us a probabilistic interpretation of the scores, okay? But we also want to take the log because when we take the log, we get a numeric benefit, right? We, are, we don't have to multiply things with small precision, which will usually create underflow, you know, things going to zero, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the scores that we have, which we computed just last time, right? I take the input vector of the image. I have my W matrix. I compute a, a function. Here, this is really easy. In a linear classifier, I just multiply the w's times the x, wx, and I get out a score. Okay, So that was my original naked score that I was using in the multi-class SVM setting. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, push it through this function. Okay, This is the softmax function, which is just going to uh, take this into an exponential form. Okay, and then normalize it against all of the other coefficients so I get um, a, a column vector that will sum to 1. Okay, so this whole thing should sum to 1. Okay, so that's called the softmax function, right? So as I said, uh, here when we are doing um, this, we want to maximize the log likelihood okay, or equivalently for a loss function because we're thinking about loss here rather than scores, right, when we want to compute this Li, right, this thing here, um, then what we would want to do, oops, I got rid of that, uh, is that we want to compute instead the negative log likelihood. So that's why I have a minus and a log here. All right, so I'm going to take the negative log likelihood of this probability value. This probability value is just um, the softmax function up there. So uh, that's the summary of it. You know, this is uh, if you just put all of those things together, that would be my loss function. I basically take the score, right, of the correct class. Okay, take that into an exponential form, exponentiate it. Okay, and then I take the scores for all of the incorrect classes, sum them together. Okay, and that will be my denominator, and that will be my loss function overall. Okay, so let's take a look at what this works like. Okay, so again, these are the SVM outputs um, that we're working with. This is the S, SIs, right, for each of the classes, 
Where did my thing go? Okay. Um, I have an SI for cat. I have an SI for car, right? And I have an SI for frog. Okay, and I'm just going to compute this loss function for each of the, the classes. Okay, so when I take the exponent, then I get these values. They're basically unnormalized probabilities, right? And then I'm going to pass it through this, uh, this summation, which is going to take all of those scores and uh, normalize that so that they get into zero, 1 range, all right? So I do it this way, and then, well, this is not actually 0, 0, but close to it. So then uh, these coefficients will sum to 1, and I have a probability distribution. OK? So then I can look at the, the loss, right? The loss is just basically how much um, did I get incorrectly for um, these parts. So let's start with a, a question. Right, what's the minimum and maximum possible loss for Li? Right here is different from the SVM loss. Remember the SVM loss, you had cared about all of the incorrect answers, right? So we sum summed over all of that, right? In uh, in the softmax loss, we're only calculating the single value corresponding to the positive class, right? Okay, so the loss for an entire training image is basically just this one thing. There's no outer summation, right? There's nothing over here that sums over all of the classes. So that's not here. It's just this single number that comes out. Anyone take a guess? What's the minimum possible loss? It'd be zero. How would I get a zero, though? Let's think about this. How would I get a zero? That would mean um, that this has to be zero, right? This value has to be zero. OK, and these other values have to be uh, high. Oh, sorry, this would have to be one, sorry, right? One, because the negative log of one would be zero. Right? But for, in, for this to be 1, that means everything else has to be a 0. Right? And in most cases, you're going to get scores that are not going to represent that, because that would mean that cat would have positive infinity, and everything else would have to have negative infinity. Right? For this exponentiation to give you something that would look like uh, a free normalization to give you a 1 here. Right? So even though at the limit, the maximum possible loss is one. It's not really realizable. Okay, you you typically get some uh, rational range for your score. Okay, um, you know, not too high or not too low. The computing uh, uh, accuracy of your 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 data structure. Okay, um, so these are going to be close to one or close to zero, but not not exactly either one. Okay. And again, let's think about what happens when we initialize w to all zeros first. Okay, then what does that mean? All of our uh, outputs would be zero here, right? Because uh, we, in uh, linear terms, our w's are just times the x, so we get all zeros for our scores. Then what are we going to get? All right, let's say they're all zeros, then all of the things after exponentiation will be the same number. We normalize them, then it'll be uh, a uniform probability against all of the classes, right? Right. So what's our loss then? It's related again to the, the number of classes, right? It'd be 1 divided through the number of classes, right? OK, so basically, you're getting some idea of the differences between these two loss functions. Basically, the mechanics are all the same, right? We are going to start over here by having our weights, whatever they are. Okay, We have our biases, which we can also learn, 
Okay, but let's say these things are given to us, and we have this column vector that represents the image. We multiply this together using just standard um, uh, matrix multiplication. We add the coefficients, um, and then we either compute the hinge loss over here, which is, as we said earlier, just trying to make sure all the things are correctly classified with some margin of error, you know, some acceptable tolerance level. Whereas in cross entropy loss or softmax, that's what we're doing, we actually are always getting some values that we can push more towards zero. Okay, so it's very different from hinge loss. Hinge loss is basically saying, why don't you classify things correctly? I don't care. All right, uh, it's good enough for me. Okay, but cross entropy loss or softmax is saying you can always do better. Because we already saw earlier, it's almost impossible to get a score of one, right? Because it would mean that on this side, before, after we do W times X, the positive class would have to be some unreasonably high, exp uh, you know, close to infinity value, and all of the other ones would have to be minus infinity, okay? So in the sense, cross uh, softmax is giving you something uh, much more uh, fine-grained to optimize against. Okay, so um, the lecturer asked, you know, okay, let's assume I get some scores out. Okay, suppose I take a data point, I want to make sure that the algorithms are working properly. I jiggle a little bit, you know, instead of exactly 10, maybe it's slightly different. What happens to loss in both cases? Right, can you generalize from what I, I just told you about these two things? Right, so over here we have the SVM loss on this side, right? And over here we have the softmax loss. In SVM, I think there's no significant loss. Yeah, there's no significant difference if we change it slightly different. But in case of softmax, this algorithm is more optimized to adjust the strategy change. OK. That's exactly right. Do we all understand that? Exactly the proper data that we're talking about because SVM is using this hinge loss where there's a max function and a zero function. Once it gets that data point correct, it doesn't care, right? So let's say in, in this case here, for example here, if I change this to 9.9 .9 or 10.1, the margin of difference between the uh, wrong classes is still very big. So the loss is still gonna stay zero. It's not gonna change. Right? So in this case, all, uh, at least this one and this one, it's not going to make a big difference. It might make a slight difference for this one because the, the difference is, uh, you know, exactly one right now. Okay? But for the softmax, it, it does matter. Every little bit counts. Okay? So uh, when a point moves a little bit in the softmax space, the optimal place shifts. Right? There is exactly one optimal, whereas in SVM, there are many, many optimal positions because a lot of places could have zero loss. Okay, so uh, to recap what we have, okay, at the end of the day, this is what we have. We have some data set of points, okay, X, Y, which could represent a, a collection of images. Right, the x's would be these long vectors representing an image. The y would be its classification. We have some score function that we're going to use to calculate. And uh, for right now, we've only looked at linear uh, classifiers, which just take uh, w times x. Right, and we uh, have to dictate some loss function. It's going to look either like softmax or SVM. And both of these are going to be plugged into this uh, full loss function which is going to incorporate the loss over each individual uh, image plus a regularization loss. And we haven't decided exactly what form of regularization we care about, but we argued earlier that, you know, sometimes a complex model is not a good thing because you're going to fit all the data, but you're not going to generalize well, okay? So given this loss function, how do we find the right W, okay? And so I'm going to switch because I didn't put everything into PowerPoint yet. Let's go back to uh, uh, the deck that they had. OK, and we're going to talk about optimization. <coughs> and then we're going to finish it up. 
So optimization, you can just think of as you know some type of uh, standing in on a landscape, a three D landscape, and then trying to uh, um, go up or down. Right. That's that's what optimization is. You have some function that you're trying to get a minimum or maximum value. Right. So you can think of yourself standing at the Swiss Alps. Right. Uh, you're standing here and you want to find the fastest way down to the minimum point in this landscape. Right. So how do you do that? Well, uh, 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 one idea that you can think of is just try different W's. Right. So I have a W. I randomly generate another W. And I evaluate that against my loss function. If the loss function turns out to be less bad, meaning more close to zero, I teleport there. So you can think of this landscape as uh, some you know, um, parameter space. So if you think about a core, um, sorry, uh, just x and y directions are latitude and longitude, you could think of that as x1 and y1, uh, x1 and uh, x2. And your y value would be, uh, you know, Basically, uh, your z value here would be the loss function, right? Uh, you, you go down to the minimum value in this, this Cartesian space. So if we were to do this random search, right, basically what it's saying here is, uh, oops, uh, yeah, I, I am going to randomly pick a w, right? So I'm going to generate 3,000 uh, or so random integers. And then I'm going to calculate the loss for that. If it's better, then change it. So that would mean, for example, instead of standing here, I just teleport randomly into different spaces here and just try, try to figure out what height I am if I'm at a lower height I trade places, right? Okay. So obviously, that's not a very good idea because we, we could use some information about the topology of this space to guide our search rather than randomly teleporting around. So. Um, we could do this, but it doesn't, it doesn't work well in practice because uh, you have to try so many different uh, parameters in order to get something slightly better. So obviously, the right thing to do is to follow the slope. You know, if you're at the top of a mountain and you look locally around where you are and you see, OK, if I, if I take a step in this direction, I'm going up. And because I'm calculating loss and I want to go down, that's not a good idea. So I want to go down. So maybe I step, take a step in this direction. Oh, that looks like I'm going down. I'll go in that direction. Yeah. So, uh, so state of the art. Sorry, that's a bad abbreviation. So uh, basically, they're looking at the data set, this uh, CFAR data set that uh, they, they had in the, the beginning of the lecture with 10 classes and 50,000 images. How well does the state of the art algorithm do? It does about 95%. So that means you give it uh, 19 of the 20 images in a, a data set, it'll get 19 of them correct, one of them wrong. Right? So if I use this uh, method of finding the test set, uh, sorry, the uh, parameters, and I run this a number of times, uh, maybe I get 15% accuracy, okay? which is horrible. But uh, you know, for doing no work at all, it's not so bad. Okay, so what we can do instead is follow the slope, right? So we're going to follow the slope down because, again, we are calculating loss. Loss has another name, too. You might hear about risk minimization. So that means the same thing as loss. So uh, when you do mi risk minimization, you're basically optimizing the loss to be zero. Okay, so we want to follow the slope downhill so that we get closer to losses of zero. So that's really easy to think about. If you have a one-dimensional uh, variable, right? Basically, we learned this in calculus, that uh, in, in order to optimize that, you can use Newton's method or anything like that. And to do that, you need to find the derivative of the function. right? So I look at the function, my loss function, and uh, I take its derivative by uh, moving a small distance away from my current point, recalculating the loss function, and then finding the slope. Right? So the slope is going downwards, then I want to take a step in that direction. Right? So in multiple dimensions, that idea of a slope is just generalized to the term gradient. Right? So basically, we have partial derivatives in every dimension. Okay? So in the xy coordinate space, I could go one step in the x direction, one step in the negative x direction, or I could step one step in the y direction, or one step back behind me in the negative y direction. So I want to take the gradient uh, both with respect to x or with respect to y. Okay? And then the gradient is basically this vector that comprises of all the partial derivatives for every dimension in my space. 
right? So if I have a two-dimensional space, it would represent, you know, one vector going in one of these 360 degree directions, right? So the slope of any direction is basically the dot product of the direction with the gradient. So if I want to find the steepest way down, the fastest way to go downhill, then I take the negative gradient. If the gradient is positive going up, then I go in the opposite direction. OK? So how do we do that? We could do this like this. OK, so pretend I have these uh, 10 coefficients that correspond to, you know, cat, dog, air, uh, sorry, the uh, coefficients uh, with respect to um, the pixels and the class, okay, whatever, all of these 3,000 or so parameters, okay, and, and I uh, send it through my loss function, I get this value 1.25, okay, and what I could do is something like this, I could say, oh, well, I'm going to perturb the first dimension by a tiny bit, okay, corresponding to changing my w a little bit in one direction. I take a mini step in the landscape in one direction, right? And then I recalculate my loss. Oh, well, let's see, one, two, five, three. This is one, two, five, three. Two, two instead of four, seven. Slightly better, okay? So maybe I should go in that direction. Maybe I should go in, in, in steps positive in, in this uh, w1, right? So I can send this through my formula, right? Okay, basically I take the difference between the loss, I divide it through by my step size, Oh, that looks like my partial derivative for, for this direction. So I have a slope of negative 2.5 for stepping in the x direction, All right? So this is my gradient vector uh, for, for w, my um, partial derivative for all of them, right? So I could do this for all of the dimensions, right? And I calculate this here, so it looks like um, we shouldn't go in this direction because it actually increases the loss Okay, so I have a positive coefficient here. Okay, and I could do it for the third. Maybe that doesn't change anything. But actually, to numerically com uh, compute that, right, because the loss is a function that we defined, right? So why don't we define it in such a way that it's analytically easy to calculate, right, rather than numerically calculating? We can always use a numeric version like this to do the computation, but it's rather cumbersome. And if you can see here, basically, in order to calculate the true gradient, I have to go through all W coefficients here. There could be a lot, right? We have 3,000 something of them. And if we have 10 classes, that means we have 30,000 numbers here. So even to just take the partial derivative requires 30,000 computations of this sort. That's not so easy, okay? so. There's no way, there's no reason to do something like this. If we can just define a function for the loss, we can analytically, analytically using calculus, symbolic computation, compute the partial derivative, right? We want this, um, this thing here, which is basically saying, I, I'm going to take the derivative of the loss function, and because it's, uh, you know, componentized, especially uh, if we take the SVM loss, for example, we can just compute the gradient of... Um, of the loss function with respect to uh, the w, right? And so we know how to do that. That's just calculus, right? So uh, we can do that uh, and get an analytic gradient instead and use that to compute it, OK? So what this slide is uh, trying to say is that there are two approaches that we've looked at. One is a numeric approach. One is an analytic approach. And depending on how you define your loss function, sometimes the analytic approach is very good because it's, you can compute it easily depending on how you've defined the loss. But if your calculus is not so good and you make a mistake in your analytic uh, loss, then everything will go wrong when you try to optimize. You'll be going in a direction that's not well defined in, in, with respect to optimization. So what they suggest is to do a little bit of both. It's actually very easy to write code to do the numerical gradient. Right? It's basically several nested loops. You take a small step in one side, recalculate the loss, you compute the slope with respect to that, and you do that for all of the things. Right? So it's easy to write the numeric gradient. It's really, really slow, and it's not exact. But at least doing it this way, you're guaranteed, if you can write code somewhat well, to get a good result. It's just going to be very slow. So what they suggest that you do is you do this to proof check 
whether you did this correctly. Okay, because sometimes you calculate the analytic gradient, you know, whatever this thing is here. Okay, if you look at this, this doesn't look so easy to take a, um, a partial derivative of. Okay, um, so sometimes when it's not easy to do that, uh, when you're trying to code it, you will make a mistake. And you will make a plus instead of a minus, and then, you know, you won't know any better because it just computes some value. Right? So the point is that you use both of these together to help yourself. This is very easy to write, but you wouldn't use it in practice. Okay? This is fast, but you have a, a propensity to make mistakes in coding it. Okay? So you do both. Okay? You always use the analytic gradient when you know it's correct. Okay? But you have to know whether it's correct first. So you use a small number of uh, examples in low dimensions, and you calculate whether the analytic gradient and the numeric gradient coincide. If they do over a wide range of values, you're probably somewhat sure that your algorithm is working correctly. Okay? So um, that's what they advise. Check that you're competing the gradients properly when you're coding your own system. Okay, so gradient descent is a, a wonderful algorithm. You know, it's basically this idea of, you know, you're on some type of landscape, you take a step in the direction of steepest descent, and you go that direction, right? So vanilla gradient descent looks very simple, right? So for example, uh, I've got some weights, okay, here. I have some data. I have a loss function. Then I just compute the gradient, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my weights in such a way that I'm going to take the appropriate step size. I, I haven't talked about what this is, OK? And then um, uh, and the weights uh, for that and do an update. Basically, I'm taking a step in one direction. And I'm just going to do this forever until my loss is 0 or until I, I run out of CPU and I, I've uh, charged too much compute time to my boss, OK? So it's going to look like this, right? So we're going to start here at this uh, some place in my parameter space. So uh, pretending, again, my W only has two parameters, an X1 and a uh, W1 and W2. So maybe I start over here, and then I compute a gradient. Maybe it's pointing in this direction. And then, uh, sorry, the gradient would be in this direction. So I'm going to take a step downward. So I have to take the negative to the gradient, and I'm going to go this direction. OK? So there was something that we said here, which is, oops, step size, right? So I need to evaluate the correct step size. So you can see where that might matter, right? The step size corresponds to how long do I want to go on this, right? If I take a small step size, that means, you know, I have to reevaluate the gradient all the time, and I have to take many, many small steps, right? So yeah, it could take a long time to get to the part where I want to. But on the other hand, I'm going to take a very smooth path. Okay. If I take a large step, I could overshoot. Let's say I start from here. My next weight update puts me over here. Then I take the gradient again. The next weight update puts me here. And then I'm like going back and forth, bouncing all over the place. Right? So the step size is pretty important to optimize so that you, you get into this uh, region of global minimum. Okay. So uh, yeah, I think there's uh, animations here, but I don't think. Uh, yeah, OK, we'll try, see whether that works. So this is one of the algorithms that uh, can work. You can see how it's going uh, down into the red area, which is the steepest uh, cent. So this is the vanilla algorithm that we just saw, Okay, taking a, a step size, a, a fixed step size, and trying to get to the, to the bottom there. OK, so. Let's take a look at this other one. So there are a number of different algorithms being uh, contrasted versus the vanilla algorithm that we talked about. So the, the black one is the vanilla algorithm. And you can see that even though some of the other algorithms of one in purple and blue are, are um, not making such a good guess uh, beginning, they converge faster. Right, so it depends on the way you tune the parameters and you take the step size to get you that. So obviously, the faster you converge to the bottom, the better, right? Because you don't have to take as much time to optimize your parameters. Okay, so this comes to the point where uh, we make the first change in gradient descent, which is called stochastic gradient descent. 
Okay, so one of the things we, we just talked about is that uh, if we take the loss function and we naively have to compute it, we actually have to compute over all of these n points. Okay, we have to compute the loss over all n of our training examples in order to create loss, and then I have to create the gradient over that loss. So if I have 50,000 images, I have to compute the loss for each individual image, sum up all of those, just to take the gradient. That's a lot of work. So what people will do instead is say, you know, I don't want to go through the entire exact loss function. You know, I have a large amount of data for training. That could take a very long time. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample. <laughs> I'm going to take, you know, random data points in my data set and hope that those points are representative. But, you know, it's going to be a small sample. It's like a Gallup poll, you know, when you're doing voting or something like that. So you take a representative sample and you calculate the loss on that sample. <clears throat> Okay, so instead of having all 50,000 points, you sample maybe 30 points, and then you compute the loss over those, only those 30 images or those 30 points, and then you calculate the gradient with respect to that, and then you take a step. Okay, so that's the idea. So with stochastic gradient descent, basically we pick a set of examples, a mini batch, if you will, Okay, and hope that that mini batch is a representative sample of the actual distribution of your data, and calculate an approximate gradient. Right, it's a it's a gradient, it's a true gradient, but it's approximate in the sense that it's not representative of the entire sample. Right, you don't know whether it's true or not. So what happens in SGD is you take a step in the direction um, of steepest descent on your mini batch, which is not guaranteed to be the same as the actual gradient. Right, but it's approximate. But the point is that if you have to take a lot of these types of steps, right, these errors average out, okay, and you get the same performance as normal gradient descent, but much more cheaply because you can execute so many more steps, but you do it stochastically, right? So instead of investing, you know, the time to go over all n for one iteration. You split it up into 10 parts, and I take 10 steps, okay? So I will still have gone over all n points, but I will have taken 10 steps, and all of them are approximate. So I can accelerate the way that I go down, okay? So a lot of uh, optimization does this, and they have different ways of calculating this size of the mini batch or size of steps. Okay, so uh, uh, you can look at the demo. I, I haven't run this today, so I don't know what it's going to show us. Okay, here you can see uh, what what it's doing. This is just taking uh, the gradient uh, of all of these and then um, going around it. Okay, so it's just trying to keep all of the green parts green. So you can see the hyperplane is switching to put all of the green parts in the green layer, the red parts in the red, and the blue parts in the blue. Right. So uh, you can change the regularization parameter, and you can change it from um, softmax or uh, the, the SVM loss that we talked about earlier. And you can change the way the regularization works. Okay, so um, it's... It's a good idea to try to play with these values a little bit yourself so that you understand what the, the coefficients are doing and how they vary the data. So all of this is manipulatable. You can just go, go in and stop this and change these things yourself up or down and see what, what that's doing. OK? So typically, yes? So uh, yeah, you could say that. I think that's a good good characterization. Do you want to explain why? Uh, because like uh, if, uh, every time if we if we use uh, same data for like optimization, uh, uh, basically like uh, uh, gradient descent method is just going to uh, just going, uh, using uh, like a steepest 
uh, way, but the, like if we use a, a, a random sample data, then sometimes like uh, it's useful to like uh, find your like uh, 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 my point is that if we use a uh, every time uh, same data to uh, using the gradient descent, uh, we just go to us uh, uh, finally we reach the uh, same place. But uh, if we use a uh, randomized data, sometimes go to another find another way. Uh, so this may be a help to him not to go like go straight to uh, uh, local optimum. Okay. But yeah, I, I think yeah, this is not always. So uh, I'll try to paraphrase what you're saying. So pretend that in this landscape here, we have a lot of local optima. Okay, so there are lots of valleys that are local, but we want to try to find the global minima, right? So if we use the full gradient, uh, depending on where we start, we're always going to converge to the same local minima. So from here, maybe, for example, I'll end up somewhere down here. Okay, but the global minima might be behind this mountain range, right? So when we take a stochastic uh, sample, there's some probability, non-zero, that you know I'll wander and I'll end up behind this mountain range, right? So uh, doing a stochastic process in, in the optimization many times helps you overcome these local features, right? So you can converge better to a global one by having a stochastic algorithm for that. So that's a good point. And usually that's coupled with uh, restart. So maybe you train the algorithm a couple times, starting with different places in your landscape. So maybe I'll start off here on one seed, and maybe I'll start off over here, and I'll start off over here. And every time I start off, I run this optimization process, and I might converge to different W, which means that there are different local minima. OK? Okay, so uh, I think the last part was about image features. So here, uh, we might have some features that we get from an image that represents different things. So I might have, like, for example, color information here. I might have textual information, uh, texture information here, and uh, maybe brightness information here. Okay, but when we um, try to compile our vector, we just maybe concatenate them all together like that, okay? And that creates some type of problem because we're, again, as we talked about earlier, combining different types of features into a single vector and treating all the things uniformly, okay? And so what happens then is sometimes you won't be able to take those features and uh, linearly separate them. So one thing that you'll learn about um, a lot is in, uh, sorry, neural networks and other uh, systems, is that we want a nonlinear transform. So imagine that if we had all of those x and y values, where the x would be, let's say, x1 and y would be x2, two different feature sets, that uh, we, we would want to separate the red and the blue class. Okay, But they all end up um, not being linearly separable because of this, Okay, because the points lie on different parts of the plane. But if we can introduce some type of way of transforming the x and y coordinates to another set of coordinates, let's say we use this as a polar representation. Instead of x and y, we're going to change it to r and theta to represent polar coordinates. When I take these same points and graph it like that, oh, well, lo and behold, I get something that's linearly separable. Right? So I need to find some type of transformation function that's going to allow me to take this, these original data points, x and y, and uh, put them into another space where a linear separator is possible. Right? So after <coughs> applying some feature transformation, points can be separated by this linear classifier. So even if we have something as similar as just drawing hyperplanes, I can actually make that work if I can find other transformation functions that's going to map these points into a space where eventually they're going to be linearly separable. Okay, so uh, for example, I have a color, uh, color histogram. So I might say, okay, uh, one way to think about images is I'm just going to take the image of this whole thing and I'm going to take the pixels, all of the pixels, and bin them into one of these uh, bins, either purple, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, and so I'm going to build a histogram. So this particular image of a frog has mostly greens, 
okay? And um, I can do this with some other more uh, well-established techniques. So I talked about in the first lecture how people had been doing feature engineering. One thing that they did was for uh, histograms of oriented gradients. So uh, basically each part of the image is a small box. And for each uh, eight by eight pixel box, I'm gonna try to detect what are the most salient the orientation of edges. So here in this a box, you can see it looks like it's pretty straight across. So you can see here the gradient, um, the oriented gradient here is uh, basically just one direction, which is horizontal. On this region here, you can see that there's a strong diagonal this way and maybe a little bit that way. So you can see it looks like this. Okay, and so what we're going to do with this, this set of gradients is just come up with a number of bins, right? So uh, this image gets divided into about 1,200 bins. In each bin, there are about nine numbers. So I have 1,200 uh, 8 by 8 uh, pixels, and each of those generates nine numbers, so 10,800 features. And so what we can do then is uh, use this idea to create something that's called a bag of words concept. And this was borrowed in part from information retrieval, less IR, uh, in, um, sorry, less NLP, but more IR. But basically the idea is that for these types of uh, algorithms, either textures, histograms, or oriented gradients, we can sample random patches of the image Right, and then try to build a feature from that. So, for example, if I was a color histogram, I'd say this green, this is a green patch, this is a white patch, etc. Okay, if I did uh, oriented gradients, I'd say this is a, a top left to bottom right diagonal, this is a um, slightly vertical diagonal. All right, and I'm gonna just put them um, in this space and I'm gonna do clustering. Okay, so if I was clustering with respect to image histograms, maybe I'd cluster these uh, three together as uh, green patches, maybe this one as a black and green patch, maybe this one as a gray patch, okay? If I was doing it by gradients, maybe I'd end up with different clusters, okay? And so for each cluster, I'm going to pick a representative patch and use that to form a code book. Okay, so basically, I formed this code book here. Okay, these are just random patches that came out of uh, sampling lots of random patches from images and clustering them. So these are like the ones that are most different clusters. And this is going to form some type of visual vocabulary for an image. Okay, so what do I do with this image code book? It corresponds to like uh, signatures within the image. Like what, what, how can I represent an image as a inventory of these features? So let's go back to the idea of a histogram, right? So if I think of each of these uh, visual words, okay, as a particular dimension, I can quantify how much an image has of that, okay? So for example, if I want to encode an image, I'll take this image and say, you know, how much of this image could be explained by this type of patch? Well, this is a patch that's going from top left to bottom right. So actually, that's pretty prominent here. So I have a high value for that histogram, OK? And so what I'm doing is basically finding out some way of characterizing the image as a bunch of histograms, whether it's color, uh, texture. But maybe in this uh, system, uh, I'm building a representative of the pictures by going through this idea of clustering first. So I don't predefine what my features are. Right here, I've dictated that the features are these particular color histogram bins, you know, magenta, red, orange, yellow, green. But in this one here, I'm letting the data speak. Right? I'm saying I'm going to cluster the random patches, and by this clustering process, I'm going to find representative visual words that are defined on the data, the training data. So I don't artificially say magenta is a good bin, orange is a good bin, green is a good bin. If I have lots of pictures of frogs, then maybe there'll be various shades of green that will be separate bins. Okay, 
So that's what we mean by this, OK? So a lot of these systems um, that we see are actually very similar to um, the previous versions that we were talking about, OK? Where originally, when we were talking about the history last week, we said we have an image, OK? People come up with these types of features, like the histogram of oriented gradients, or color gradients, or code books, or things like that. And we extract these and use this as a feature representation. So I'm going to ca calculate all of these features, whether it's pixel values or uh, histograms or things like that. I'm going to linearize them into a vector. okay? And I'm going to uh, use machine learning to find the Ws for this function, right? this Ws that correspond to all of these Xs here. And we'll spit out this um, hypothesis that tells us how likely we think each of those classes are. OK, so this is what we call the image engineering approach that's very common in natural language processing still to this day, much less common in vision and speech processing now. OK, but it used to be very common. OK, the idea that you would have to use your knowledge to come up with features to represent this thing. OK, and then use machine learning to do that. Okay, now in the preview of what's going to happen over the course is that we want to move to this architecture. Okay, and this architecture is actually the same as this one. It's just that coming up with the features is not done by human hands. It's done by the math. Okay, so going through a very general idea of linear regression just stacked on top of each other, we can hope to generate these types of features. OK, so we can uh, create primitives. And those primitives will be arrayed with a deeper layer to create uh, uh, edges. And those things will turn into corners and uh, illumination areas, et cetera. We can think of it that way. Uh, through the process of going through the simple pixel values and then going through the convolutional networks in, the, in order to get the final result. OK, so uh, last week we talked about this system. This is AlexNet, OK, uh, I think around 2012 or so when things in deep learning started to really take off. And basically, it's saying instead of using machine learning just over the features, right? this is what the blue arrow is saying, we're going to use it all the way from here all the way down to the pixel values. OK, so we're not going to come up with features. We're going to let the algorithms, the statistical information in the data, find those features for us. Okay, And that is the power of deep learning. But in actuality, I think a lot of people are, are somewhat disillusioned because when you have to do this end-to-end -end training, there's a lot of engineering in the hyperparameter setting. So finding the right set of Ws becomes much more complex. Uh, in this case. And there are lots of tricks to it. And uh, that's what we'll go over in the next couple of lectures. OK? So uh, next time, we're going to do an introduction to neural networks and how to train them using backpropagation. And I think we had a gentleman here who wants to talk about uh, you know, startups in Stanford and, and other opportunities that are available to, to people if they wish. Yeah. So uh, right now, it's kind of like this stuff. Actually, it's like. Side project is 